In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, to love him, and to better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the ultimate mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a sirat nabawiyah, the prophetic biography. We've been talking about, discussing at length, uh, the Battle of Uhud. One of the major uh, events of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, this was in the third year of Hijrah, shortly after the month of Ramadan, in the month of Shawwal. What we talked about previously was the fact that um, basically how the battle started to wind down with the turn of events where the Khalid bin Walid along with the cavalry was able to attack the Muslims from behind. Um, and then the mushrikun who were initially fleeing from the battlefield, they also turned around and came back and created quite a bit of uh, an issue for the Muslims. The Prophet of Allah himself was very badly wounded and injured. He bled quite profusely. Uh, great companions of the Prophet ﷺ, like Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, Musa bin Umair, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and many, many others were also uh, killed uh, during the battle, were shaheed, were martyred during this time. We talked about how the Sahaba basically tried to uh, rally around the Prophet ﷺ. They took the Prophet ﷺ to the backside of the mountain where they were able to kind of sit him down at a safe place, a crevice, kind of almost like a small cave, um, and then flank, uh, you know, kind of fan out in the area and defend the Prophet ﷺ. We talked about how they treated the wounds of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And previously, one of the remarkable things we talked about was Umu Umara, uh, the Sahabiya, the female companion of the Prophet ﷺ by the name of Nasiba, who defended the Prophet ﷺ, who fought and defended the Prophet ﷺ. What we're going to talk about here today is basically picking up from here. And we're going to talk about something that initially will be very difficult, and then uh, in contrast, we'll talk about something quite beautiful and remarkable. And these are two contrasting situations from the Battle of Uhud, and they are quite remarkable. Ibn Kathir, uh, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, uh, ta'ala, all the major scholars of the Sirah, have mentioned these incidents back to back, as a sort of a comparison, an analysis, and for the purpose of reflection. Um, and so let me go ahead and mention the incidents, and then we'll talk about them uh, from that point on, inshallah. So the first incident that I'd like to talk about is that um, Ibn Ishaq rahimahullah ta'ala, he narrates that some of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they relate, they say, كَانَ فِينَا رَجُلٌ أَتِيقٌ لَا يُدْرَى مَنْ هُوَ that there was a man amongst us, it was, he was a strange man, he wasn't from the community, he wasn't somebody very familiar to the Sahaba, لَا يُدْرَى مَنْ هُوَ they didn't really know exactly who he was. So, يُقَالُ لَهُ قُزْمَان some people said that, um, you know, his name was or he was referred to as Quzman. فَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم يَقُولُ إِذَا ذُكِرَ لَهُ إِنَّهُ لَمِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ That when he was, later on when people would mention him or mention his story to the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet wasallam would say something quite, uh, sh- you know, shocking and serious about him. He would say that he is in the fire of hell. And again, we don't ever say that about anyone, but the reason why the Messenger of Allah ﷺ has the ability to say that is because he receives divine revelation. He was given this knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, إِنَّهُ لَمِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ And then he would explain, فَلَمَّا كَانَ يَوْمُ أُحُدْ قَاتَلَ قِتَالًا شَدِيدًا So the, the narrator, he explains why the Prophet ﷺ would say that. 
<clears throat> he says that when it was the day of Uhud, he, this man Quzman, he fought very valiantly. Right? He fought very uh, aggressively. فَقَتَلَ وَحْدَهُ ثَمَانِيَ أَوْ سَبَعَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ He single-handedly killed eight or seven people. وَكَانَ ذَا بَأْسٍ And he was a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. He goes on to say, فَأَثْبَتَتْهُ الْجَرَاحَ Eventually he was injured very badly during the course of the battle, which basically kind of dropped him. Um, and he suffered such an injury or a wound that it basically uh, debilitated him, incapacitated him, and he fell in the battlefield. فَحْتُمِلَ إِلَى دَارِ بَنِي ظَفَرِ He was carried over to the area of Medina where Banu Dhafar lived, and he was basically carried there amongst the wounded. فَجَعَلَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Excuse me, فَجَعَلَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ يَقُولُونَ لَهُ Some of the Muslims started to say to him, وَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ أُبْتِلِيتَ الْيَوْمَ يَا قُزْمَانِ فَأَبْشِرْ <clears throat> They started to say to him, that O Quzman, you have been tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day, the day of Uhud, congratulations. What that exactly means is that they're saying that, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only gave you the ability to fight in the battle of Uhud, not only did you fight very bravely in the battlefield, and you know, incurred many losses, inflicted many losses upon the disbelievers, but thirdly, you suffered a serious wound in the battlefield, which basically is a sacrifice in the path of God, in the path of Allah. Like Abshir, congratulations. You are such a fortunate, blessed person that Allah accepted you to fight for His deen, to defend His deen, and to suffer a loss for the deen of Allah. So you're a very blessed person. He responded by saying, وَمَاذَا أُبَشَّرْ وَبِمَاذَا أُبَشَّرْ He said, well, why should I be happy? Why would you congratulate me? What's there to be so celebrating about? What should I celebrate? What do you want me to celebrate? فَوَاللَّهِ إِنْ قَاتَلْتُ إِلَّا عَنْ أَحْسَابِ قَوْمِ He said, I only fought for the respect and the dignity of my family and to represent my people. وَلَوْلَا ذَلِكَ مَا قَاتَلْتُ If it wasn't for that, I never would have fought with you people. If it wasn't for that, I never would have fought with you people. Quite that's even more shocking. Then the narrator goes on to say, فَلَمَّا اشْتَدَّتْ عَلَيْهِ جَرَاحَتُهُ أَخَذَ سَهْمًا مِنْ كَنَانَتِهِ فَقَتَلَ بِهِ نَفْسَهُ As his wound got more severe, as his wound got worse, his injury, he took an arrow from his quiver that was near him, and he killed himself with it. He finished himself off. There's another incident about Khaybar that is similarly narrated. Uh, is, uh, there's a similar type of incident about the Battle of Khaybar that is also mentioned in the books of Sirah, which we'll talk about it when we get to the Battle of Khaybar. But nevertheless, you have this one incident. Somebody who fought, fought bravely, and was able to even suffer an injury in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fi sabilillah, fil jihad, fil qital, we know all the reward of fighting in the cause of Allah. And in spite of all of that, because of the lack of sincerity, because of the lack of purity, because of the lack of understanding and faith and belief in Iman that this person suffered from, that this person eventually left this world committing a sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completely prohibited and forbidden, where the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said something so unfortunate about him, that this person is in the fire of hell. So it shows you, there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that talks about this, that sometimes a person will do the actions of the people of paradise, and then eventually at the end will do an action of the people of hell, and that person, because of that, will be doomed to the fire of hell. Or, on the flip side, a person will do the actions of the people of hell, 
and eventually conclude his or her life with the actions of the people of paradise, and because of that they will be from the people of paradise. This is why the Prophet ﷺ says, we are very, uh, rightly so, but we are very familiar with the narration, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ That actions are based upon, actions are contingent, actions are rewarded according to, actions are aided by, supported by, the intentions. But what we also have to understand, there is a similarly authentic narration of the Prophet ﷺ, which says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِينَ That actions are based upon, actions are rewarded, actions are contingent, actions are aided, and supported, and viewed in light of how they conclude and how they end. How they conclude and how they end. And you know, it's something that you think about a lot, and it's something that, you know, was on my mind for the last couple of days, was the fact that this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ particularly, is just oozing with wisdom. And, and I, I taught, you know, whenever I explain this hadith, I give the example, and again, uh, I always, um, you know, ask forgiveness for the analogy. But in sports they'll oftentimes talk about that it's not necessarily how you start the game, but it's how you finish the game. Right? Anybody can have a good first quarter, but who can have a good fourth quarter? Anyone can have a first good two minutes of the game, because everyone's fresh and energized. But what really determines a winner is who can have a good last two minutes of a game. And similarly, we find this predicament in many areas of our lives, how do we start something? Right? And how do we finish something? As tulab al-ilm, as students of knowledge, is something our teachers would constantly remind us about. It was easy to go to class every day, be there bright and early, leave there after hours, get all your homework done, take all your notes, the first week of class, the first month of class. But what about the last week of class, the last month of class? It really determines a lot of things. And so, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ How do actions end? How do they conclude? And that's why one of the most, like, one of the things that the aslaf, the pious predecessors, the early generations of Islam, the remarkable people that we talk about, that we read about, that we learn about, that we quote all the time. There was something that they were very, not quite paranoid, because paranoia is not a good quality. But there was something that they were stressed out about. There was something that they obsessed over. And that was what is oftentimes referred to as Husnul Khatima. They obsessed over Husnul Khatima. Right? That how will my life end? That makes a big difference. And see, the predicament is, you don't know when it's going to end, how it's going to end, where it's going to end. You don't know, that's a big mystery of life. So they would basically live their entire lives in a manner in which they wanted their life to end. So that any moment that it ends, I'm ready for it. The Prophet ﷺ validates this idea in so many different ways where he says, مَن كَانَ آخِرُ كَلَامِهِ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Who's ever the last words out of somebody's mouth are لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ That person has entered paradise. Has entered paradise. Because in order for your last words to have to be لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ You had to live a life of لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ and so it's so important to stay consistent. A very famous story that is oftentimes told, Wallahu ta'ala a'lam about the authenticity of it, but nevertheless just as a general story, it's really remarkable that one very pious person, a great scholar, he was near his death, he was near the end of his life. And shaitan comes and gives him waswasa, and basically says that you've escaped. You survived. You made it. And he says, not yet, not yet. And he's saying it out loud, not yet, not yet. 
And one of his uh, sons who is near him says, Father, why are you afraid to die? You say, not yet, not yet. And he says, oh, no, no, I'm not saying it to death, not yet. He says, shaitan was giving me this thought. This thought occurred in my mind. It was waswasa. I made it. I survived. Right? Shaitan wasn't able to get me. And he said, as soon as that thought crossed my mind, that waswasa came to me, that's why I was saying verbally, out loud, to defeat that idea, not yet, not yet. That until I have a breath left in my body, the soul has not departed from my body, I, ga- the game's not over yet. And this is one last trick of shaitan, to l- get me to put my guard down. One last moment. For me to just lower my defenses for one moment. And so I said, not yet. No, 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 no. Not yet. You're not going to get me yet. So it's, it's a very powerful idea. So even though this is very difficult to talk about, but nevertheless, we see this example from the battle of Uhud, of a man who fought valiantly, practically almost died as a shaheed, but that's what we say, didn't die as a shaheed, almost, and almost doesn't count. Now, on the, and what, what was exposed at the end? Somebody might say, this isn't fair. Somebody makes all this sacrifice and it gets snatched away from in the end. No, the end exposes the internal condition that was there throughout the life and throughout the deed. The end exposes the internal condition. And he exposed it himself. That if it wasn't for the honor of my family, I never would have fought with you people. Right? So that end exposes the internal condition. Now on the flip side, on the flip side, let's look at another incident. Really remarkable. There's another incident that is mentioned um, by Ibn Ishaq, rahimullah ta'ala. It's also mentioned by Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hajar mentions it in Al-Isaba um, and also authenticates the narration. He says it's an authentic narration as an authenticator of hadith. Ibn Hajar, rahimullah ta'ala. And Ibn Kathir mentions it as well. That... Um, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was asked that haddithuni, haddithuni, he would say to people, his students, haddithuni an rajulin dakhal al-jannata lam yusalli qattu. He would say to his students, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, tell me, he would test his students, tell me about the man who went to paradise without praying a single prayer without offering a single salah. Because the sahaba, their understanding of salah was, salah is absolutely mandatory, necessary. They're just, they couldn't fathom the idea of somebody being Muslim and not praying. It was unfathomable to them. It was bizarre, the concept. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ Allah refers to iman as salah. Like He refers to salah as iman. Right? So it was unfathomable, the idea, that a Muslim doesn't pray. So he would say to his students, حَدِّثُونِي عَنْ رَجُلٍ دَخْلَ الْجَنَّةَ وَلَمْ يُصَلِّ قَتُّ Tell me about a man who went to paradise and he never prayed. فَإِذَا لَمْ يَعْرِفُ النَّاسُ سَأَلُهُ And if the people didn't know the answer to the question, they would ask him, you tell us. Ya Shaykh, Ya Aba Huraira, Ya Sahabi Rasul, you tell us. So he would respond, مَنْ هُوَ فَيَقُولُ أُصَيْرِمْ بَنِي عَبْدِ الْأَشْهَلِ he would say that it was a man, you can all, uh, his, this is also mentioned about him in his biography, in Usul uh, Ghaba, um, that <clears throat> he would say his name was Usayrim, and he was from the tribe of Banu Abdul Ashal. And, or sorry, his name was Amr bin Thabit bin Waqsh. Amr bin Thabit bin, uh, I'm sorry, his name was Usayrim, he was from the tribe of Banu Abdul Ashal. So the narration goes on to say that, فَقُلْتُ لِمُحْمُودِ بْنِ لَبِيدِ كَيْفَ كَانَ شَأْنُ الْأُسَيْرِمِ So I asked him, tell me about Usaydim. He says, كَانَ يَأْتِي الْإِسْلَامَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَلَمَّا كَانَ يَوْمَ أُحُدْ بَدَالَهُ He used to regularly hear about Islam. Whenever Muslims would travel, whenever caravans would come, whenever the da'wah of Islam, somebody would come and try to preach to his people, that he would listen to it. 
regularly people would try to go and you know preach to the people of Banu Abdul Lashal. So he would hear the message of Islam quite frequently. But when the day of Uhud came and he came to the battlefield, that's when it just occurred to him. When the day of Uhud came, it occurred to him that this Islam is the truth. I need to embrace this Islam. فَأَسْلَمَ ثُمَّ أَخَذَ سَيْفَهُ So he accepted Islam, he picked up a sword, فَعَدَى حَتَّى دَخَلَ فِي عُرْدِ النَّاسِ And he rushed into the battlefield, split the ranks, and went straight until he started fighting with the people. فَقَاتَلَ حَتَّى أَثْبَتَتْهُ الْجَرَاحَةُ And he fought until eventually he suffered a very serious wound. فَبَيْنَا رِجَالٌ مِنْ بَنِي عَبْدِ الْأَشْهَلِ يَلْتَبْمِسُونَ قَتْلَاهُمْ فِي الْمَعْرِكَةِ And when the people of Banu Abdul Ashhal they came looking for any people from amongst their tribe who might have died in the battlefield, إِذَا هُمْ بِهِ They found him. فَقَالُوا وَاللَّهِ إِنَّ هَذَا لَأُصَيْدِمْ They said, oh look, there's Usaydim. مَا جَاءَ بِهِ What is he doing here? He wasn't even a Muslim. He wasn't even Muslim. What is he doing here? وَلَقَدْ تَرَكْنَاهُ وَإِنَّهُ لَمُنْكِرٌ لِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ We left home in the morning to join the Prophet ﷺ, the Muslims from Banu Abdul Ashal. They said, we left home in the morning to join the Prophet ﷺ in Uhud. And when we left at that time, he didn't believe in all of this. So how did he end up here? فَسَأَلُوهُ So some of the narrations mentioned that he still had some life left in him. He wasn't completely dead. They found him basically breathing his last. So they said that, why are you here? He said, أحدبن, they asked him, أحدبن على قومك? Did you come here just because some of your tribe's people were here to just look out for them and defend them? أم رغبة في الإسلام? Or are you really serious about Islam? فقال بل رغبة في الإسلام. He says, rather I am serious about Islam. آمنت بالله وبرسوله وأسلمت I believe in Allah and I believe in His Messenger and I have submitted. ثم أخذت سيفي وغدوت مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم And I picked up my sword this morning when this thought occurred to me after the sun had risen and this thought occurred to me, I grabbed my sword and I rushed out here to Uhud to fight by the side of the Prophet ﷺ. فَقَاتَلْتُ حَتَّى أَصَابَنِي مَا أَصَابَنِي And I fought until you see me here in my condition right now. فَلَمْ يَلْبَثْ أَنْ مَاتَ فِي أَيْدِيهِمْ And while they were holding him in their hands, having this conversation with him, he gasped and breathed his last and he died. فَذَكَرُوهُ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. They mentioned him to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَقَالَ إِنَّهُ لَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he is from the people of paradise. He is from the people of paradise. Again, it shows you the sincerity. This man wasn't Muslim for half a day. This man was not even a Muslim for a whole day. He wasn't even Muslim for a whole day. He was Muslim for half a day. He didn't even get to pray a single prayer, a single salah. He accepted Islam after Fajr and he died before Dhuhr. And the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah about whom Allah says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٍ يُحَىٰ He doesn't speak from himself. Everything he says is revelation and divinely inspired. And every word out of the mouth of the Messenger وسلم, is guaranteed is true and sound, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says about the man who became Muslim after Fajr and died before Dhuhr, إِنَّهُ لَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ He is in paradise. Remarkable. Such a small, humble deed. But it had sincerity. That's why the Prophet sallallahu said, فَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ وَلَوْ بِشِقِّ تَمْرَ Protect yourselves from the fire of hell, even if it be with half a piece of a date, not even a whole date, a piece of a date. That if all you have, your sole possession is a date, one date, one piece, that you split that in half, you eat half of it yourself, and you give half to somebody else, sadaqa, a hungry person, that that can save you from the fire of hell. 
The other man, Muslim for a while, killed seven or eight people, fought bravely, seemed like a hero in the battlefield, and died and the Prophet ﷺ says he is in hell. This man was Muslim for a few hours. Didn't even know all the arkan and all the different things and probably couldn't have recited any Qur'an to us. Didn't know tafsir or you know, memorized dozens of a hadith or given you the fiqh of this or the fiqh of that. And the Prophet is saying he's in paradise. Sincerity. Quality. Not the quantity, but quality. This is a remarkable comparison that is presented to us here in the story of the Battle of Uhud. Along those same lines to talk about this type of sincerity, that there is a story of Amr bin al-Jamuh. Amr ibn al-Jamuh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, Amr ibn al-Jamuh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he is a very notable Ansari, a very notable companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He was amongst the seniors. He was one of the elderly residents of Medina who had become Muslim. And him accepting Islam was considered quite a big deal in Yathrib in Medina early on when he became Muslim because he was one of the seniors. He had four sons. And the narration Ibn Ishaq, the narration Ibn Ishaq mentions, um, actually says about it, about him, وَكَانَ لَهُ بَنُونَ أَرْبَعَ مِثْرُ الْأُسُدْ He didn't just have four sons, his four sons were called lions. They were considered lions in their community. So he was a very proud, honorable man. Not proud in the negative sense, not boastful, but proud meaning very dignified. He was a very respected, dignified, accomplished elder of the community. He had raised four men, strong men, who were considered like warriors and defenders of their community. So when the day of Uhud came, and they, they went for Badr, they had participated in many of the saraya, even the small skirmishes and campaigns that happened before, before Badr. They had participated in those, they participated in the battle of Badr, يَشْهَدُونَ مَعَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ And they would go on to participate in many battles with the Prophet ﷺ. فَلَمَّا كَانَ يَوْمَ أُحُدْ أَرَادُوا حَبْسَهُ But when the day of Uhud came, Amr bin al-Jamuh said, I am going for Uhud. And they said, no you're not. Why? Because he was not only an old man, but أَعْرَجْ شَدِيدَ الْعَرَجْ in his old age, he had such a severe problem with his leg that he very seriously used to limp. Like he would have to walk with a cane, he would need help sometimes to walk. He couldn't even walk on his own sometimes. That's how bad his leg had become in old age. So they said, no, 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 you can't go. And they said, in Allah qad adharak. Allah has given you, has excused you. Allah has excused you. All right? has exempted you. فَأَتَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم, He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, إِنَّ بَنِيَّ يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يَحْبِسُوا نِي عَنْ هَذَا الْوَجْهِ وَالْخُرُوجْ مَعَكَ فِيهِ He said, my sons, they want, they are attempting to not let me go and go and fight by your side, O Messenger of Allah. فَوَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَأَرْجُوا أَنْ أَطَعَ بِعَرْجَتِي هَذِهِ فِي الْجَنَّةِ he said, and I would like to limp around with this busted leg in paradise. Right? And that's just his desire speaking. Of course, no one's gonna have a limp in paradise. Unless you want to. But that doesn't make any sense. Right? So nobody's gonna have a limp in Jannah in paradise. But he's saying, like I'd like to drag this busted leg into Jannah, Ya Rasulullah. And they're trying to prevent me from doing so. So, the Prophet ﷺ says, أَمَا أَنْتَ فَقَدْ عَذَرَكَ اللَّهِ Look, he said, look, the Prophet ﷺ is also the faqih, the mufti, the everything, right? So he says, the ruling on the issue is, Allah has exempted you. Allah has excused you from this. فَلَا جِهَادَ عَلَيْكَ So I need you to understand, jihad is not mandatory on you. It is not mandatory on you to go. But then he turns to his sons, 
who were also there because they came to argue their side. وَقَالَ لِبَنِي He said to his son, to the sons of Amr, the Prophet says to the sons, مَا عَلَيْكُمْ أَلَّا تَمْنَعُهُ But you also do not have the right to prevent him from going. You do not have to go. You do not have the right to stop him from going. لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ أَنْ يَرُزُقَهُ الشَّهَادَةِ how do you know? Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to be shaheed. Maybe Allah wants to gift him with shahada. Right? So how can you stop him? فَخَرَجَ مَعَهُ فَقُتِلَ يَوْمَ أُحُدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ So he went out with the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Uhud, and he died as a shaheed in the battlefield. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. So the next thing that we'll talk about here is the next thing that I'll, I'll mention here is specifically about uh, one of the unfortunate things because in the next uh, session now we'll start talking about the actual janazah, the burial, and the return back to Medina. Um, basically concluding and moving on to the next discussion from the Battle of Uhud. So what I'll talk about here at the end of today's session is something again very difficult to talk about and very unfortunate. I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. <clears throat> so one of the things I wanted to mention was that when, as the battle was kind of concluding, um, they were basically going around searching for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, and of course the Sahaba had already discovered that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was alive, they were defending him, and they were protecting him. So some of the Sahaba, when they would see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like Ka'ab bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he started screaming, فَنَادَيْتُ بِأَعْلَى صَوْتِ He started, he says, I started screaming at the top of my, at the top of my lungs, يَا مَعْشَرَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ أَبْشِرُوا هَذَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He actually says something very beautiful. He says, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from a distance, and I saw the sparkle of his eye. Like I saw the clearness, the glimmer, the sparkle of his eye from a distance. And just seeing those eyes from a distance, I knew that was a Prophet Tazharan. <laughs> I saw the beauty of his eyes from a distance. And I, know, I knew that eyes that beautiful can only belong to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so I started screaming out, يَا مَعْشَرَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ أَبْشِرُوا هَذَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He says, فَأَشَارَ إِلَيَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم أَنَّ أَنْصِتْ And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, be quiet. That don't attract any negative attention. That we're trying to basically wrap this up and minimize our losses. Anyways, as the... Um, one of the other individuals that I wanted to mention here briefly towards the end of the battle is that the Jews of Medina, because Uhud was right outside of Medina, so technically speaking, the Jews had a pact with the Muslims that they would defend Medina in the situation that Medina was attacked. They would each defend Medina, the Muslims and the Jews. And the Jews of course went back on this and they decided not to protect Medina. They didn't come out to fight with the Prophet ﷺ. So there was one of them, his name was Mukhayriq. Um, Mukhayriq, he belonged to the Jewish tribes and he called out to a lot of his Jewish brethren at that time. He said, يَا مَعْشَرَ يَهُودِ وَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ أَنَّ نَصْرَ مُحَمَّدٍ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَقٌ He said, oh, you know, Jewish folks, Jewish people. He said, you know, that helping Muhammad ﷺ is obligatory upon you. This is an obligation upon you. You signed a contract. They said, "Qalu in al yoma yomu sabt." Oh, it's Saturday, so we can't fight. He said, "La sabt lakum." He said, "This is preposterous. Saturdays are not for this reason. This is just an excuse." And so, فَأَخَذَ سَيْفَهُ وَعُدَّتَهُ He grabbed his armor, he grabbed his sword, and he said, إِنْ أُصِبْتُ فَمَا لِي لِمُحَمَّدْ يَسْنَعُ فِيهِ مَا شَاءَ He said that if I die in the battlefield, I bequest all my wealth to Muhammad, and he can do with it whatever he wants. ثُمَّ غَدَى إِلَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ فَقَاتَلَ مَعَهُ حَتَى قُتِلَ And he went and he fought with the Muslims until he was killed in the battlefield. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he was told about his situation, the Prophet ﷺ said, مُخَيْرِيق خَيْرُ يَهُود Mukhayriq was the best man amongst the Jewish tribes. He was the best man amongst the Jewish tribes. 
So there's a lot of very remarkable people and remarkable incidents at this particular time. Now the thing that I wanted to conclude by talking about, like I said before, it's very difficult to talk about, it's very unfortunate. But I alluded to this earlier that unfortunately, some of the mushrikun of Mecca, particularly Hind bin Utbah, whose father, uncle, and brother were all killed in Badr, her and some other of uh, the individuals from Mecca, unfortunately, very unfortunately, they mutilated the bodies of some of the Muslims. Some of the dead, the martyrs who had fallen, particularly Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And it said that, Hatta أَخَذَتْ هِنْدْ مِنْ آذَانِ الرِّجَالِ وَأُنُوفِهِمْ خَدَمًا They were cutting off their noses, and they were cutting, out their, cutting off their ears, and so much so that Hind bin Utba, she basically threaded them together, made a necklace out of it, to um, kind of, you know, desecrate these bodies, or to, to mutilate these bodies. وَأَعْتَتْ خَدَمَهَا وَقَلَائِدَهَا وَقِرَتَهَا وَحْشِيًا She gave it to Wahshi almost as a trophy. It also mentions, وَبَقَرَتْ عَنْ كَبَدِ Hamza. She also ripped open the chest, the body of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and ripped his liver out of his body. And some of the narrations mention that she even chewed on it. فَلَاكَتْهَا She chewed on it. فَلَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ أَنْ تُسِيغَهَا فَلَفَضَتْهَا But she became just so uncomfortable, it was so disgusting that she then threw it away. Some narrations like Musa bin Uqba actually says it was Wahshi who ripped open the body of Hamza and ripped the liver out and get, went and gave it to Hind bint Utba. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala mentions both narrations and says, Wallahu ta'ala a'lamu bis sawab. Allah knows best exactly what was the incident. Nevertheless, we just do know that it was Hind. It was either she did it or it was due to her instruction to Wahshi that this was done. Another narration also mentions that um, Abu Sufyan um, also, um, somebody passed by Abu Sufyan and they saw that he took the base, the end of his spear, and he was jabbing the dead body of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the other side, not the, not the sharp side of the spear, the other side, the stick. He was just still, he was jabbing kind of the face of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, like pushing his face, his jaw with it. And another one of the leaders of Quraysh passed by, and he was saying, Dhuq, Uqaq. Dhuq, Dhuq, which means taste, Uqaq. Uqaq basically means to kind of betray your family. He says, taste your betrayal. And he was doing this, being disrespectful to the body of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Hulais, Hulais, who was another leader of Quraysh, or actually he was a leader of the Ahabish. These were some kind of nomadic tribes, Bedouin tribes that lived outside of Mecca, who had come to fight with the Quraysh. But still being a leader, he passed by Abu Sufyan doing this, and he said, Ya Bani Kinana. Powerful. Because Kinana is the forefather of Quraysh, and the forefather of not just Abu Sufyan, but also of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And by calling him Banu Kinana, he's saying, this is your cousin. This is your blood. Ya Bani Kinana. Hadha Sayyidu Quraysh. Hamza is a leader of Quraysh. Yasna'u bi am, bi, uh, no, I'm sorry, he's talking about Abu Sufyan. He says, Hadha Sayyidu Quraysh, you are supposed to be a leader of your people? Yasna'u bi ibn ammihi ma tarawna lahman? You treat your own cousin like a piece of meat? How could you do that? And so Abu Sufyan immediately kind of caught himself. You know, in the heat of the moment in the battle, he caught himself and he said, Wait, Haq. He says, shh, 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 quiet, quiet. He said, Uktumha anni, fa innaha kanat zalla. He said, please don't tell anyone I did this. This was a mistake on my part. He obviously did end up telling somebody, but that's why we're talking about it. But he said, don't tell anybody. I made a mistake. Right, so this was very unfortunate what happened. Anyways, <clears throat> at this particular time, Abu Sufyan, he climbs up onto the mountain and he screams out, 
ان عمت فعالي ان الحرب سجال يوم بيوم بدر اعلو هبل announcement we talked about earlier and at that time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu to respond to him and umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu responded to him saying that because abu sufyan said things are now equal you had badr we got uhud and umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said la siwa la sawa he said things are not equal why qatlana fil jannah wa qatlakum fil nar the people that died on badr from amongst you they went to hell the people who died on uhud amongst us today they go to paradise so things are not equal easy there and then at that time uh, abu sufyan says to him he says that well but we killed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he uh, umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu says la wa innahu la yasma'u kalamaka alan he says no he's still alive and he can hear you and abu sufyan even says he says ibn qami'a one of the mushrikun he told me that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is dead and you're telling me he's alive but i have to admit i'd rather believe you than him because he's a liar and he's a really terrible person so i'll believe you nevertheless at that particular point in time they dispersed from there and they started to pack up their things and leave at that point in time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam calls ali bin abi talib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and he tells him ukhruj fi athar al qaum i want you to scout i want you to spy on quraish as they're leaving the battlefield fanzur mada yasnauna wa ma yuridun look at what they do cuz that'll tell us what they're intending to do the way they leave the battlefield tells us what they're intending look at the prophet says some such the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um has such wisdom and foresight and even strategy all right look at the strategy of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says fa in kanu qad jalabu al khayla wa mtata'u al ibla he says that if they tie up their horses they tie their horses to the camels and ride the camels fa innahum yuriduna makkah that means they're going back to makkah wa in rakabu al khayla wa saqu al ibla but if they ride their horses and they tie up their camels to their horses fa hum yuriduna al madina then they're trying to sneak around us and go and attack madina while we're still here licking our wounds wal ladhi nafsi bi yadihi in araduha the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says i swear by allah if they want to go to madina la asiranna ilayhim fiha thumma la unajizannahum if they go try to go to madina i will go there right now i will cut them off at madina and i will deal with them I will repel them from Medina I will defend Medina as the honor and the sanctity of Al Madinatul Munawwara and the city of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said blood on my face or no blood on my face if they go towards Medina I'm going to go there and defend Medina with my life right so at that particular time Ali bin Abi Talib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he he says fa kharajtu fi atharihim i went and started spying on them scouting them anzuru madha yasna'un i was watching what are they doing fa janabu al khail they tied up their horses wa mtata'u al ibla and they were uh, excuse me they tied up their horses and they were riding their camels wa wajahu ila makkah and they turned their direction uh, towards makkah and started to head back towards makkah I will conclude because it seems like a very good point to conclude upon what I'd like to conclude on here because we'll be talking about the some of those who were shaheed and those who died in the battlefield the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam finding the body of Hamza radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took care of the shuhada of Uhud as well um, but the last thing I'll talk about here to conclude with is the dua of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam imam ahmad in his musnad mentions that after the battle of Uhud was concluded and the mushrikun left the battlefield before they did anything else the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made a dua the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam offered a prayer supplicated he made a dua and what was the dua of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam there after uhud in the battlefield the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told the sahaba istawu hatta uthni ala rabbi azza wa jal the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said line up so that i may praise our master allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fa saru khalfahu sufufan they lined up in rows behind the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam raised his hands and he made the dua 
He said, Allahumma lak alhamdu kullu. Oh Allah, for you alone is all praise and the ultimate praise. Allahumma la qabida lima basatta. Oh Allah, nobody can take away what you've given. Wala basita lima qabatta. And what you have not given out of your wisdom, nobody can give it. Wala hadiya liman adlalta. Nobody can guide whom you have chosen not to guide. Wala mudilla liman hadayta. And nobody can misguide whom you have guided. Who, whom you have given guidance to. وَلَا مُعْطِيَ لِمَا مَنَعْتَ Nobody can deprive, nobody can give to the one whom you have deprived. وَلَا مَانِعَ لِمَا أَعْطَيْتَ And nobody can deprive the one to whom you've given. وَلَا مُقَرِّبَ لِمَا بَعَتَ Nobody can bring quicker or sooner what you have delayed. وَلَا مُبَاعِدَ لِمَا قَرَّبْتَ And nobody can delay what you have given or brought Immediately. Allahumma absut alayna min barakatika wa rahmatika wa fadlika wa rizqik. Oh Allah, open upon us the doors of your eternal blessings, your mercy, your benevolence, your sustenance, your provision. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-na'im al-muqeem, alladhi la yahulu wa la yazul. Oh Allah, I ask you, for your eternal blessings, your lasting blessings, that do not, are not diverted, they don't leave, nor do they expire. Allahumma inni as'aluka na'im yawm al ayla. Oh Allah, I ask you for your blessings on the day of great difficulty and great despair, the day of judgment. وَالْأَمْنَ يَوْمَ الْخَوْفِ I ask you for safety and security on the day of fear and trepidation. Allahumma inni aaidun bika min sharri ma aataytana wa sharri ma manaatana. Oh Allah, I ask you to protect us from anything bad coming as a result of what you've given or what you haven't given. Allahumma habib ilayna al-iman. وَزَيِّنْهُ فِي قُلُوبِنَا O oh Allah, make faith, iman, beloved to us, and beautify our hearts with faith and belief and conviction. وَكَرِّهْ إِلَيْنَا الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِسْيَانِ And make disbelief, ingratitude, sinfulness, disobedience, make it detestable and disgusting to us. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الرَّاشِدِينَ Make us from amongst those people that not only know what they have to do, but are able to do what they have to do. اللَّهُمَّ تَوَفَّنَا مُسْلِمِينَ O oh Allah, allow us to leave this world in a state of submission to you and only you. وَأَحْيْنَا مُسْلِمِينَ Allow us to live this life, as long as we are alive, allow us to live in submission to you and only you. وَأَلْحِقْنَا بِالصَّالِحِينَ Allow us to be joined in being the ranks of those people who are righteous and pious, غَيْرَ خَزَايَا وَلَا مَفْتُونِينَ Without any type of loss and any type of serious test or trial. اللهم قاتل الكفرة الذين يكذبون رسلك ويصدون عن سبيلك. O oh Allah, you defeat these people who reject and deny your messenger and prevent people from believing in you and following your religion. وجعل عليهم رجزك وعذابك and you send down your anger and your wrath and punishment upon them. اللهم قاتل الكفرة الذين أوتوا الكتاب إله الحق. And O oh Allah, you defeat these people who were given the book. By the, true, by the true Lord and Master Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they decided to reject it. And this narration is also mentioned by Imam Nasa'i. It's an authentic narration. And this was the dua the Prophet ﷺ made at Uhud. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakfirku wa natubu ilayk.